Hello. Welcome to May the Source Be With You. My name Hi. is Sarah Norrell. This is Christine. We're here to talk to you about sources, types of sources, and how to evaluate sources. So I'm just going to share the screen. Okay, so again, I said, my name is Sarah, this is Christine, just a little bit about us. I'm the business and social sciences librarian. And in case you ever wanna contact me, my email, phone number, and my Twitter handle is here, just in case you're interested in following. Same with Christine. Hi, I'm Christine, I'm the STEM librarian. I'm also the communications and criminal justice librarian email, phone, and Twitter also. Woohoo. So our goals, hashtag goals today in this workshop, we're going to talk about primary versus secondary sources, scholarly versus non-scholarly or popular sources, um, types of web resources, and how to Google smarter, not harder. So first, we're going to talk about primary versus secondary sources and tertiary sources, which we don't hear about as often, but they're a thing, so we're gonna talk about them. So first comes first, primary sources, and that is indeed why they're called primary sources. Um, Webster's Dictionary defines primary as first in order of time or development or direct or first hand, and that plays right into what a primary source is. Um, so these are a couple of examples, visual examples of primary source. Now, keep in mind, that uh, what looks like a primary source in one discipline may not look anything like a primary source in another discipline. So um, as the history librarian, we use journals, uh, journal entries, so personal journals. So if you see in this uh, left hand or leftmost picture, a written journal or diary, that is an excellent example of a primary source in the history research field, but for instance, in science fields, that may not work. Um, perspective, the perspective of the author or the creator, um, did they experience the events um, or I guess the experiments um, firsthand? So that is what you wanna think about when you are evaluating a source to see if it is primary or not. Um, is, it, is it contemporary to the time period being studied? So for instance, if you're looking for a primary source um, regarding World War II, you would look for something that happened, excuse me, not happened, but that was um, logged or uh, published during the dates of World War II. Now, Secondary sources, alternatively, are written by scholars about primary sources. So we're looking for things that include the information about those primary sources, but they are not those primary sources. Um, we're looking, again, what looks like a secondary source in one discipline is not necessarily a secondary source in another. So that's just kind of a good general rule of thumb. Um, and in these cases, the author or creator is going to synthesize observations and information from other sources, including those primary sources, when they include them in these secondary sources. Now, tertiary sources, those are brief synopsis, usually include brief synopsis of other sources. Um, it's usually an overview and it's not in depth. So think of things like an encyclopedia entry, a wiki entry, um, things of that nature, which is why we don't hear about them as often. Now, in terms of scholarly versus non-scholarly or popular sources, We divide them pretty evenly. Scholarly are sources that are by practitioners and for practitioners. So you could say they're by researchers for researchers. 
they go through a review process and the audience that they're directed towards is assumed to have some knowledge about the subject. Um, and they will always include some form of citations or bibliography. Now, scholarly sources will more than likely, but not always, go through a peer-reviewed process. Now, this means that a group of peers, this audience that um, will more than likely know a large part about the topic, will review said source to determine whether or not it is relevant and applicable to the current research in the field. While peer reviewed almost always means scholarly, scholarly does not always mean peer reviewed. So not all things that are peer reviewed are scholarly. Excuse me, I said that totally backwards and I knew I was gonna do that. Not all scholarly things are peer reviewed, but peer reviewed always means scholarly. Um, a journal may be peer reviewed or refereed, um, and it still may be published non. In, excuse me, it still may publish non peer reviewed articles. So, just a few things to keep in mind. Um, but scholarly and peer reviewed are almost always used interchangeably. So, it can be kind of tricky. Things to look out for. Now, popular sources. These are really tricky. They're usually written for the general public. Um, the writers are not necessarily experts. In fact, they're usually not experts. Um, some are edited and they may be of higher quality, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the author is going to be an expert in the field. Um, some are self-published, um, so they're most definitely lower quality. And with that, I'm going to transfer it over to Christine, who's gonna talk about the reliability scale. Hey there. So when we're talking about um, different sources, you can think about these on a scale of unsatisfying to satisfying or um, lower quality, less healthy to higher quality and more healthy. Um, so if you're thinking about things that you can find out really quickly, like what time does a movie start or um, who was that actor that was in that movie, you can just look that up really fast. You don't need any particular expertise. Um, just like if you're hungry, you don't have to sit down and eat a full meal. You can grab a little snack, maybe you have a piece of candy, maybe you um, go down to the vending machine and get a little snack and have that um, available to you. But, you know, if you're really hungry, you want to take more time and probably eat something that's a little more filling or at least a little healthier. And your information um, needs can work that way too. You, the better the information you have, the better. And, the better informed you're going to be. Um, just like if you have better food, you're going to be better satiated by what you're eating. So like your little blogs and things like that that you might find online would probably fall down here on the candy and snack food side. Um, some of your more popular sources like newspapers, magazines, things that at least have an editor looking at them are going to be a little more filling, a little healthier. And then down here, of course, your scholarly peer reviewed journals are going to be the top of the line, the most um, full and satisfying thing that you can eat. And I'm sorry if you're a vegetarian and you don't think that's appetizing, um, but you, you know, there would still be something equally good for you. <laughs> So types of resources. Of course, not all types of web resources are created equal. Um, we have a few different icons here to show you some ideas. Um, this one is a census record from New York. There's also some icons for things like the Public Library of Science, the British Library, the American Library Association, um, and this little wheel, which is actually from ScholarWorks, which is our institutional repository. So some of these are really good. So our institutional repository um, holds the scholarship um, output, scholastic output of the university. Um, so a lot of times you'll find theses and dissertations, um, conference presentations, poster presentations that faculty and staff have done. Um, here at UT Tyler, ScholarWorks holds our theses and dissertations as well. There are good collections that are digitized. So the British Library is one example that we like to use. Um, it's a, a museum or a library collection that's been, di been digitized. 
Um, I know that one is really important when researching things like history. There are government records like the US Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, things like that that are collected under an official governing body. Uh, and therefore, they're, the data is kind of a little more stable. Um, and then things like the Public Library of Science that I had mentioned on the previous website. There's also things like PubMed, that's the um, public facing interface for the National Library of Medicine. Um, those are websites that are not necessarily under the auspices of one particular governing body, but they do have a review process. Now, the not so good, of course, there's <laughs> a flood of information out there online. Uh, things that are tend not to be so good, blogs, social media, uh, the sort of infotainment resources. And that's not to say that there aren't good ones out there. That's just to say that in general, they're not going to be particularly good because there's not a review process. Um, I hope you're getting the point that that's kind of a big deal. The peer reviewed, of course, being the most stringent process, but even um, some of the non peer reviewed things that at least have an editor looking at them have some sort of review before they're put out there. Whereas social media, everybody can share that. Blogs, anybody can get it on um, WordPress or somewhere else and write a blog. Um, I mean, you can create your own website. It doesn't even have to be based from somebody else's uh, platform. And then, of course, the infotainment kind of things that are floating around. Um, so some tips for reviewing types of web sources. Don't trust the name or the title. Um, I think we've all been victim of clickbait. So just because it looks really interesting and really good doesn't mean that the information that you're going to get from that click is any good. Um, domains, the domain name doesn't really have much governance. Like anybody can have a .edu or a .org. So while that used to be seen as a way to um, tell whether a website is maybe a little bit better. It's not a guarantee. Check for cited sources. So any of the websites that have um, a little better review process are going to have sources somewhere. It may be that, <clears throat> excuse me, that there's a paragraph of information on the website and they have footnotes at the bottom or links throughout the um, throughout the post saying, okay, I got this information from here, I got this information from there. Anytime you're able to follow the breadcrumbs back to the original source material, the original first person primary source material, you're gonna be doing um, a lot better. And then look for cre uh, creation information. So a lot of websites have an about page or a contact us page. If that contact us page is just a web form that you fill out and it doesn't tell you anything about where it's going or who's getting it or who's going to be responding to you, probably not necessarily a really good page. Um, whereas sometimes business websites or some of those um, organizational websites, you know, they'll tell you, hey, this is our board of directors. These are the people who serve um, as an oversight for our website or oversight for the information that we're providing. And there's usually at least one or two forms of contact and often even like eight or 10, depending on how many people might be on the board. So if you can find those kind of things in your website, you might be a little more sure that what you're getting is good information. So how to Google smarter. Now we have all of these wonderful resources in the library and we hope that you're using them. Um, I really hope that you went to one of our last two workshops on using the databases and on using the library website. But of course, we know that you're still going to use Google. <laughs> so how to how to do that a little bit smarter? Building your search. So if you did go to any of those workshops, you probably got some tips and tools on how to craft a search in order to get to the best results. And a lot of those tricks will also work on Google. So for instance, using the double print or double quotation marks around a phrase will help you get directly to that phrase. So instead of saying um, I want to search for echo chamber and finding results that have the word echo somewhere and the word chamber somewhere. Echo chamber in quotes will get me that exact phrase. You can use the settings in Google to get to advanced search. So we often, um, when we're demonstrating how to use our databases, we will show you where the advanced search is and how to use some of those options. And Google does have that 
I'm going to, once we finish the slideshow, I'm going to go over to Google and show you these uh, couple of things. Also, the site colon dot and then whatever the end URL is can help you eliminate some other websites. So maybe you're looking for information about um, hydraulic fracturing and you want to know what government documents have been published on that. You can put hydraulic fracturing in quotation marks and then site colon dot gov and that's going to take you to government resources about hydraulic fracturing. So. Now Google Scholar, I hope, hope, hope that you've been told about Google Scholar. Um, that is the kind of, if we could make all library resources run through Google Scholar, it might make life easier for you if you're used to using Google. Um, now Google Scholar does have a menu where you can create a profile. Um, depending on where you are in your research journey, you may be um, wanting to do that or you may not. If you are publishing quite a bit, that's a good way to get your name out there and have a repository of things that you've published that anybody can get to. Um, you can also use the Google Scholar menu to set a link for the library. So when you go in and you search for scholarly information, it will put a link out to the side saying, yes, UT Tyler, you have access to this. So. Real quick, I'm going to swap over to the internet so I can show you how those last two things work. Where did the... Uh... Which to sharing everything. Okay. I've never been able to do that before. <laughs> um, so over here, I'm going to go over to Google, which of course pops up right away. That's our plain, lovely Google website. Um, if you were doing a search for, of course, you're going to get so many results that it's almost pointless. So 25 million. But if I put those in quotation marks, 2 million. So it does narrow it down quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned before, you can narrow, whoa, <laughs> um, say I just want government resources on there. And so you'll notice that all of those websites say .gov. Um, so those are just a couple of ways that you can kind of use Google to get a little more targeted results. If we go over to Google Scholar, you'll notice that <clears throat> the interface looks pretty much the same. Um, you can go over here to the settings and it says library links. Look for the University of Texas at Tyler. You do have to spell it out. You can't just do UT Tyler. And then you click on our name. So WorldCat is um, an, an open library catalog that's global. And then this is going to say the University of Texas at Tyler. So now if I wanted to do a search, you'll see over here, there is full text at UT Tyler. So that means that we have access to that journal through our library. So. Are there any questions about that? We're looking good. One thing I did forget to do back on Google was to show you where the advanced search is. So settings for the regular Google page are down here on the bottom. And if you open that up and click on advanced search, now you see all of these nice little search boxes that you might be used to seeing when you are using library resources. So you can say all of these words, type in a bunch of different words, an exact phrase, um, kind of what we were doing with the quotation marks. 
any of these words if you um, want to pick multiple things that might be applicable. Um, none of these words, you can actually put a minus or a plus um, or minus to take those words out. So let's say you were searching for um, echo chamber, but you don't want anything that's about um, echoes. <laughs> so you could take the subtraction sign and put that there. Um, you can also narrow down your results by language, by region. Um, here is where you would do things like an actual website or the domain, like we were doing a while ago with the .gov. Um, and then you can find different ways to find the, um, where you want to find your search terms. Okay. That was a good point. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see anything out here. So um, that is the information that we had to share with you. Of course, you are always welcome to contact one of the librarians. If you need any help, your subject librarian would be happy to help you. Um, you may be wondering, how do I know who that is? When you're in your Canvas environment and you see the library resources on the left-hand side of the page, open that up. And whoever is listed as your librarian there is the subject librarian for that subject. So. Um, if you have an engineering class or a math class or a science class, that's going to be me. So um, we look forward to hearing from you and we will be placing the recording on YouTube later. So um, let us know if there's any questions. Thank you.